and welcome to Christ Church. I'm Patty Clements, Traditions Coordinator, and I'm just so happy to have you joining us today in online worship. A special welcome to our first time online worshipers. A shout out to the kids out there. Pastor Bob is going to be continuing our message series today, Living Room Easter, and the topic today is Jesus and our doubts. Pastor Andrew will be assisting Pastor Bob. And after Pastor Bob's message, Rachel will be singing a very special gospel song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. And I've got a trivia question for you. Can you recall in the Bible where there is a reference to sparrows? It's a rather famous passage. I'll give you a minute to think about that. In the meantime, let me tell you a little bit about the background of that song. The author of the lyrics was Sevilla Martin, and she was from Canada, but she had a friendship with a couple in New York by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle. And the Doolittles uh, had a lot of problems. Mrs. Doolittle was bedridden for nearly 20 years. The husband was in a wheelchair going back and forth to work, but yet they lived happy Christian lives. And they were inspiring and comforting to everybody. And at one point, Sevilla asked them, what's the secret to your happiness and contentment? And Mrs. Doolittle replied, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And that simple expression of faith inspired Sevilla to write the lyrics to this song. So throughout our lives, we'll have disappointments, we'll have discouragements, and it will be down. But always remember that God is on our side and watches over us, just like the lyrics of the eye is on the sparrow. Remember that he is with us in all that we do. Going back to the trivia question, the answer is the book of Matthew, chapter 10, uh, verses 29 through 21, uh, 29 through 31, which read, What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. And I have one other trivia question for you this morning. We're starting worship today with the hymn, Beautiful Savior. And this hymn goes by another name. Do you know what it is? It's Fairest Lord Jesus. It was written in the 1840s, a song that celebrates and appreciates Jesus Christ as the Savior of man. I invite you to join Rachel as she leads us in singing, Beautiful Savior.
as we gather this day, we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, loving Father, gentle Jesus, Lord and Savior, be with us this day. Encourage us in the midst of our confusion and our struggles. Reassure us that you are indeed Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Help us to simply believe and to know that you have already won the victory and that you will protect and preserve your people and you will guide us to the future of your choosing. So strengthen us in word today. Strengthen us in song and worship and encourage us to simply believe. Believe that you live and reign as one God in the power of the Holy Spirit now and absolutely forever. Amen. So many closed doors. Like the disciples who were locked away in the upper room after Jesus' death, we too might feel that all hope is lost in this present time. But on this morning, on this morning, the stone that sealed the tomb where Jesus was laid to rest didn't sit idle. And as it broke free from its resting place, Jesus conquered death itself. Good morning, Christ Church. I'm Pastor Bob, lead pastor here at Christ Church. It is great to be with you today uh, in your living room, and uh, that's uh, kind of the theme that we've been uh, experiencing here since Easter Sunday, that uh, looking at those gospel experiences, those firsthand accounts uh, right after Jesus' resurrection uh, when he continued to show up in the lives of people. And so we're going to keep doing that today. Uh, We're going to continue looking in the Gospel of John. Uh, If you got your word with you, I hope you do, uh, we're going to go to chapter 20 of the Gospel of John and look once again at where Jesus shows up. And we're really picking up Uh, right where Pastor Andrew left off last week. And you remember uh, last week, Jesus shows up in those locked rooms and behind those locked doors uh, and uh, just shares the good news that he's alive with his disciples. And today we pick up uh, and uh, we, we experience the life and the experience of one of those disciples. And as we've been sharing and talking, you know, the Gospel of John is uh, kind of an, a, a gospel that gets real personal. We get to know people uh, so much more intimately in the Gospel of John. And today, or we're going to get to know uh, this guy named uh, Thomas. It says, uh, now Thomas, right, also uh, known as Didymus. And I, I suspect that a lot of you already in your minds, if you're a Christ follower, if you've been in the Word, You've already said, oh, I know who we're going to talk about, right? Uh, Thomas has got a nickname. We've kind of given him that nickname, right? Uh, and so go ahead, say it, say it with me. We're going to talk about 
Doubting Thomas, right? I heard you say it, right? Doubting Thomas, right? Uh, now, what's interesting is that's the name that we give him. That is not the name that the Bible gives him. Uh, nor in the Bible is he referred to as that name, Doubting uh, Thomas. In fact, it's right here. It says, no, he's known as Didymus. Didymus, what's up with that? Well, Didymus is the word for twin. So apparently his nickname among the 12 uh, was, hey, twin, right? He was called a twin. Now, here's the other interesting thing is nowhere in the Bible do we know who his twin is, that, that there's no reference in the New Testament to say, hey, this was so-and-so, and he was the twin of Thomas. It's, it's just not there. And yet Thomas is known as, and you'll see it again in another text, he was known as the twin. Now, I find that really kind of fascinating, and, and this morning I, I kind of wonder uh, if, if the reality is that, that that's really intentional, uh, because I absolutely believe this morning you are going to come face to face with Thomas' twin, and that twin is going to be each one of us. That as we go through the experience of Thomas this morning, we're going to discover that Thomas is so often a reflection of who we are. That Thomas reflects the reality often of what we feel and what we think and how we deal with the challenges and the difficulties of our world and certainly the experiences we're going through right now. Let's get to know Thomas. Thomas shows up three times uh, in the Gospel of John. He shows up here in John 20. He's Thomas. Uh, he's known as Didymus. He's one of the 12, so he's one of Jesus' early followers, right? He's one of the 12, but he was not with the disciples when Jesus came into the room the first time. Everything Pastor Andrew talked about last week, Thomas is the guy that missed out. Do you feel like him sometimes? The guy that's always missing out, right? Something big happens and you just kind of you kind of not there, you miss out, right? I mean, Thomas is the guy that misses out on the most incredible experience in human history. Jesus rises from the dead and then shows up behind these locked doors to the disciples. And Thomas is the guy that's absent. Now, we don't know why he was absent. We don't know what he was doing. But he's the guy that just wasn't there. He missed out for whatever reason Thomas withdrew from the fellowship with the other disciples. I have to be honest with you, um, I feel like Thomas in these Sundays, in these experiences. Uh, truth is, I really miss you guys. <laughs> I just really miss uh, being together. I, I miss being in worship with you uh, in this room. This room is empty right now, and it's Kind of a lonely place, and uh, boy, I hope you miss it too. And uh, I absolutely believe the time's going to come when we're going to come back here, we're going to fill these rooms up again. I hope you are eager for that time. I hope you're looking forward to that time. Uh, we are made for fellowship, and we miss out when we just aren't together. It's just not the same. Amen? Agreed? Thomas is the guy that just misses out. He's not there. He shows up again in John 11. Uh, in John 11, uh, it is the experience where he's once again referred to as uh, Didymus, but it's also the experience of the raising of Lazarus, right? So Jesus has been with his disciples, and word came to him that Lazarus, his good friend, is sick, and then ultimately word comes and says, no, wait a minute, he's not just sick, he absolutely died. Uh, and so, you know, Jesus waits for a couple of days, and then, and then he says, okay, time to go, time to go. When he says time to go, all the disciples start, you know, talking amongst one another. They start talking to him. They're saying, wait, wait a minute, Lord, wait a minute. You want us to go back to that place outside of Jerusalem, and remember that's where all the religious leaders are, and, and remember those are the guys that are trying to kill you at this point, and they're plotting against you at this point, and oh, by the way, <laughs> if they're out to get you, they're likely out to get us. And so these guys are not so excited about going to Jerusalem 
raise Lazarus. In fact, they push so hard on Jesus, they're saying, listen, we just don't think this is a good idea. This is not where we ought to go. And Thomas, Thomas is the guy who speaks out in the midst of all of that confusion, all of that questioning. Thomas speaks up and he says, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, uh, granted, there's, there's probably a lot of sarcasm involved in his statement there, right? Kind of sounds like that. But nonetheless, Thomas is the guy that speaks up in the middle of the debate, in the middle of the confusion about what we should do, and just kind of says, whatever, whatever Jesus says, let's just go. Let's just go. Even if we die, <laughs> let's just go. Do you get a sense of this guy, Thomas? He's just kind of real. He just kind of calls it the way it is in the middle of the confusion. He also shows up in John 14. Now, this is a couple, three chapters later, uh, and Jesus in John 14 here is telling the disciples about what's ahead, what's going to happen. He's laying it out. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be crucified, and three days later, I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to go to be with the Father. But don't worry. Don't be anxious about it, because I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to prepare a bunch of mansions for you. And, and after all, I'm going to go do some great stuff. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you, and we're all going to be together. Don't worry about it. You know the way that I am going, right? So he's been laying all this out, and the disciples are just apparently sitting there and listening, uh, looking at him like, you know, deer in headlights kind of thing, right? And, and Thomas is the guy that when Jesus says, listen, you know the way that I'm going, Thomas is the guy that has the initiative and the nerve in the middle of the confusion again, right? In the middle of not understanding, Thomas says, Lord, really, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Don't you love those guys? I mean, they just kind of speak into the confusion and say, look, the, 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 what? This is the way, this is the way it is. Just, how many times has it happened when you're listening to somebody and they start laying stuff out and they start talking about stuff and it's just going like right over your head and, and you're just kind of looking and you're smiling and you're taking it in and when they're all done, there is no way you're going to say to them, I don't understand a thing you just said. Thomas is the guy that steps into the confusion and says, Lord, I, I, I don't get it. I'm confused. I don't understand what you're talking about. And of course, that's when Jesus makes that wonderful statement saying, listen, I am the way, the truth, uh, and the life. Thomas is willing to speak into the confusion. And so it is for us now in John 20, in this experience, where it is Thomas. And Thomas is the guy who is that, that window for us of understanding the confusion. I mean, think about it. Thomas, like all the other disciples, he was the one who was there, along with the others, who, who saw Jesus do all these amazing things that he did. He was there when Jesus calmed the storm. He was there when Jesus walked on the water. He was one of those disciples taking more bread as Jesus kept multiplying the bread. He was taking it out and giving it away to people. He was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. He was there. He took all of this in. He saw everything that happened. And now, Jesus is dead. And Thomas, Thomas is left with his confusion. He is bewildered. He is beside himself in trying to make sense of everything that has happened. He is questioning. He is confused. He is bewildered. He is fearful. He is wondering how and what is next. Maybe even Thomas is a bit angry about everything that has taken place. All right, let me ask you. Do you feel like his twin right now? With everything that's going on in your life, in your world, in what we're experiencing, do you feel like Thomas's twin? 
with some of that confusion, some of that questioning, some of that bewilderment, even some of that anger and that worry about what's next and what does the future hold. Then on top of it all, for Thomas, Thomas finally comes back. He goes back into those locked doors, right? Through those locked doors, gathers with the disciples again. And when he gets here, the disciples say to him, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. (laughs) What? (laughs) Wait a minute. Can't you just see Thomas, if not in his voice, in his head? Can't you just hear and see Thomas saying, what? What are you talking about? I saw him nailed to the cross. What are you talking about? I saw him when they put the spear through his side. I was there. I saw him. I heard him breathe his last breath. I saw his dead body. What in the world are you talking about? Keep in mind, for Thomas... For, for those of that time in that world, this whole concept and idea of resurrection was something beyond them. I mean, Jesus is the first one to do it. <laughs> He's the first one to reveal the possibility. For them, this was beyond comprehension. I mean, you get the experience of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. He's in Athens, and he's teaching and he's preaching. He's telling people about Jesus, about his life, about his death, and about his resurrection. And the, the, the people of Athens, the Greeks, are listening to this, and they listen to what he's saying, and their response is, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. These are strange thoughts, strange ideas, that a person who is dead would be raised to life again. And the disciples speak to Thomas, and Thomas receives it in the middle of his confusion, and in the middle of his questioning, in the middle of everything that's been going on, and he just can't comprehend. And so he says, listen, unless, right? And then he lays out three things. He lays out three things that it's going to take for him to come to an awareness and to an understanding. He says, look, unless, number one, I see the nail marks in his hands, and unless, number two, I put my finger in those nail marks, and unless, number three, I put my hand in his side, listen, I'm not believing it. I'm not going there. I'm not taking it in. I have to understand, this goes on for a week. It says, a week later. And the tense in the, in the Greek here, you get underneath it, the tense in the Greek when they said, we saw the Lord, it's not something just told Thomas once. For a whole week, they're locked in that room together. You know what that's like, right? <laughs> Being locked together with them. In a whole week, they are quarantined in that room together. And the whole time, the other disciples are saying, Thomas, we saw him. Thomas, I got to tell you, man, we saw him. Thomas, get with the program. Come on, man. He's alive. We saw him. And Thomas is digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper and saying, listen, I just can't get it. I just can't conceive of it. I'm just stuck in my bewilderment, in my anxiety, in my fear, in my questioning, and my confusion, and unless, it's just not going to happen for me. Thomas's twin, are you listening? Thomas's twin, sitting in your living room, are you understanding what your brother Thomas went through? because you're not so far away from that yourself. Here's the good news. Here's the great news. If that's what you're feeling, if you're trapped in some of the confusion and the anxiety and the fear about what the future is and about why this is happening and asking the question even, where is Jesus in all of this? What in the world is God doing? Literally, in the world, what is God doing in this, in my life? Here's the good news. 
Jesus is ready for your questions, and he's ready for your doubts. He's even ready for you to lay out to him what you need. He can take it. He, he, he willingly will receive your questions and your confusion and your anxiety. He willingly will understand what you're going through. He is not scared to enter into the confusion and the anxiety and the fear and the bewilderment. He is okay with that. You don't have to be Mr. Perfect Christian or Mrs. Perfect Christian. You, you don't have to be Miss Perfect Christian. Jesus is willing to enter into our lives where we are. And sometimes it is with very little faith. How many times did he turn to those same disciples and say, Oh, you of little faith. And so it is with Thomas. A week later, Thomas is there now. And I want you to understand the significance of this. Thomas wasn't there the first time. He missed out. Thomas is there this time, and Jesus comes back again. Why does he come back? The other disciples have already seen him. They already know the truth. They already know that he's alive. Why does Jesus come back? He comes back for Thomas. He comes back because Thomas wasn't there the first time. Was Jesus unaware that Thomas wasn't there the first time? Did he just kind of miss counting everybody there? No, Jesus comes back because he wants to emphasize this truth for you this morning. He wants you to understand through Thomas. He's not scared or hesitant about entering into not only locked doors, but the confusion and the questioning and the doubts. And so he comes again through those locked doors. And when he comes in, he speaks to them and he says the same words again that he spoke to them last time. Peace be with you. This is what he does. This resurrected alive Jesus. He comes into our world, he comes into our confusion, he comes into our questioning, and he just simply says, wait a minute, I'm alive, be at peace. I'm alive, you don't have to worry. I'm alive. You can just take a deep breath, breathe in the Holy Spirit, and understand, I've got it. In the Gospel of John, Jesus, in that place where he tells the disciples, listen, I'm leaving, but don't worry, I'm preparing for you. In that place in chapter 14, he says, listen, I'm leaving you with a gift. He's not going to leave us alone in just our confusion, our doubt, our questioning. He said, I'm leaving you with a gift. What's the gift? Peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace that I'm going to give you is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't what? Don't be troubled or afraid he is not scared of our confusion and our bewilderment and our questioning he enters into that and he says listen be at peace how can we be at peace well for Thomas when Jesus enters in Jesus confronts every expectation that Thomas had he, he is willing to cast out the doubt. He's willing to cast out the confusion. He's willing to cast out the bewilderment because he just comes in there and he says, listen, peace be with you. How can I have that peace? Listen, Thomas, look, you ask for three things. Here's the three things, right? Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Maybe not in the same order, but they're all three there, right? He's saying, listen, Thomas, this is what you need. This is what you asked for. Here it is. I will supply you with everything you need to get you beyond the confusion, to get you beyond the bewilderment, to get beyond the questioning. Jesus retains the marks in his resurrected body so that we can retain faith and peace. Think about this. When you and I get resurrected, believers in Christ, when we get resurrected, we're going to get resurrected in a perfect spiritual body. When Jesus is resurrected, he retains the marks. 
the marks of his pain, the marks of his suffering, the marks of crucifixion. Why does he retain the marks? For you, for Thomas, so that you can remember, you can look at those marks, you can see those marks, and you can understand he is victorious. He's victorious. You can cast away the confusion. You can cast away the doubt. You can cast away the questioning. Why? Because he's got the marks. He's already victorious. He's already defeated all of the sins of your past. He's already defeated all the struggles of your future. He's already defeated everything that we're going through right now. He is with us, and he is still ruling. And so he says to Thomas, listen, stop doubting and do what? Just believe. Notice the exclamation point. It's the invitation, an emphatic invitation to move beyond where you are, Thomas, and just embrace him, to embrace the gift, to just believe. It's what Paul says in Ephesians. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. It is that gift of faith that just has confidence in Jesus. And that's what happens with Thomas. Thomas goes from the confusion to a personal conviction in Jesus. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. And here we have this incredible first confession of faith after Jesus' resurrection. The guy who was in confusion, the guy who was bewildered, the guy who was questioning, wondering, he experiences that presence of Jesus, the peace that comes from that, and the confidence of faith. And that confidence leads him not simply to one confession in that locked room to say, my Lord, my God, but it drives Thomas out into the world. And Thomas becomes that missionary that carries the gospel into India. And Christians today still claim Thomas as their patron saint. They still claim Thomas over in India, those Christians, those few, as the one who brought the gospel to them. And ironically, Thomas has such conviction that he not only carries the gospel to India, but he dies a martyrdom. And of all things, he dies with a spear plunged through his back. Kind of interesting, isn't it, when he talks about the spear as part of the evidence, the spear hole? It becomes a very thing for him that he's willing to die for, the gospel truth. See, Thomas becomes a window for us to understand there is blessing in belief, to cast aside the doubt, to cast aside the confusion, to cast aside the bewilderment, and carry us confidently into a future that says, even though we don't see it completely, we believe it. That's what Jesus says to them. Jesus says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Twin, Thomas, this is the invitation today. If you're feeling that confusion, if you're feeling that bewilderment, it is the invitation to be like your twin and just believe. Look at the nail holes in his hands and in his side. Believe the witness that the whole of Scripture brings to us that Jesus is Lord and God. And as that was true for Thomas, it's still true today. And there's nothing we're going to experience that can change it. And there's nothing we're experiencing in these days that is beyond his victory. And that belief, that conviction, drives us to share that truth with others. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much 
for showing up in our living rooms today and giving us that, that window through the life of Thomas, that window of understanding that we can just trust you and we can just believe that you still bear those marks of victory. And those marks tell us again and again and again that you always win. And you will win over the circumstances in our lives right now. You will lead us into a future that you choose for us. And it may not be easy, Lord. It may not be the future we expected. But it will be the future you bring us through. So, Lord, thank you that we can fall before you today like Thomas and we can just trust you and echo those words, my Lord, my God, and just cling to the belief, the conviction, the faith that you are with us in our confusion and you will carry us through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh
in the midst of our doubt, confusion, and fear, whether we have great faith or little faith this morning, we as Christian people continue to cling to the Christian faith that has been handed down to us. We continue to arrive at the Christian confession found in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to join me as we share in that confession now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Bound together and united in this confession of faith, let us come before God with prayer and thanksgiving. Please pray with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, loving and saving, resurrected Jesus, holy and sanctifying Spirit, we call upon you, our one true triune God, and lay before you the petitions of our hearts. We pray for those in our midst, Father, who are hurting, doubting, those who are wrestling with the confusion and the fears so readily prevalent in today's world. We pray for the doubting Thomas, those beside us, Lord. And we ask that you would comfort, strengthen, bring the peace that only you can bring into their lives. Bring faith as only you can. We pray for those who are in a midst, who are in need of your hand of healing, who are struggling with sickness. We pray for those in our midst who are struggling with mourning and need your words of comfort and consolation. We pray for those who are lonely who are struggling with not having their normal routines and normal relationships quick at hand. We pray that your spirit and your power and your love would reach into their lives, that you would reveal yourself to them just as you revealed yourself to Thomas. Father, we pray for our community the communities in which we work and play, for communities and their well-being, for their management and stewardship. We pray for government authorities, those in positions of authority and decision-making for wisdom and insight. Father, we pray for our church. We pray that we would continue to be a church that lifts lives, that elevates you, that is a church oriented towards those who aren't here yet as we continue to bring the gospel to more people, more lands, more lives, just as the early church did, just as Thomas did. We pray that you would use us, your church, to bring the story of Jesus resurrected and alive into more and more lives. Father, we lay before you the many facets of our lives, our needs, our hurts, our concerns. We lay before you our joy, our hope, and the anticipation of the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we ask and pray that you would hear these things, spoken and unspoken, as we join now in praying the way Jesus, you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do indeed come before God, recognizing that too often in our confusion and in our doubts, we make mistakes. We lose sight of faithful living, and we lose sight of Jesus. And yet God is compassionate. God is loving. Jesus is forgiving. And so this morning, we once again turn our attention towards both repentance and acknowledging the ways in which we have fallen short, but also towards words of grace and words of compassion and love, words of forgiveness. Let us join now in a moment of confession and absolution. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Christ is indeed rich in mercy, rich in love, rich in grace this morning, which he seeks to give unto you. Hear now a definitive and proclaimed word of forgiveness in love over you and your life. As a called and ordained minister in the church of Jesus Christ, by his voice, with his authority, I declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, we pause to both appreciate and say thank you, as well as invite your continued generosity so that we can continue to be a radically generous church. If this is your first time tuning in and joining us for worship this morning, thanks for being in worship. We're so grateful. We never ask our guests to give a monetary gift. You've given the the gift of being in worship, and for that, we give you thanks. For those of you who are regular attenders and covenant members, we continue to be a radically generous church in this day and age, and so we continue to invite that radical generosity moving in and through you so that it can move in and through us as a larger community into the lives of those around us. We're currently exploring new and exciting ways in which we can continue to be a blessing in our communities and in people's lives, particularly in this time of need and neediness. We're excited to share more about that in the coming weeks as we continue to bless more and more people. 
Thank you for being a radically generous church. You can give online. You can do that by clicking on the button below. You can also head to the website, ChristChurchMequon.org or ChristChurchMequon.life. Thank you for continuing to be a radically generous church. If you have need of sending a check in, we continue to receive checks. Shoot, if you want to drop off a wheelbarrow full of gold bars, you can do that. We'll meet you at the church. We are just grateful to continue to be a church that is dedicated to God's generosity in this world. Thank you for being a part of that, and thank you for your generosity as well. We continue to be Christ Church, a church that is lifting lives, elevating Christ, a church for those who aren't here yet, even as we move in this day and age to being a virtual online type of community. There's a bunch of ways in which we're exploring new and dynamic ways of being church online. One of those ways, in a way, uh, chance for me to give you an invitation to join me. Uh, we're exploring and starting something new and exciting. We've been doing it for a few weeks and having a lot of fun with it, and I want to extend the invitation to have you join me as well. On Tuesday nights and on Thursday mornings, we started something called a C3 Stream. It is a video podcast where you can tune in on Facebook, Vimeo, YouTube. You can tune in and come join me for moments of deeper learning and deeper understanding if you want to grow your faith. On Tuesday nights at 7.30, it's Tuesday night teaching. Right now we're going through some time looking at each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, examining their themes and their theology, the author, and finding out more about what each of those Gospels is trying to communicate to us. Or you can join us on Thursday mornings, 7.30 a.m., for morning meditation. It's a time where we spend reading Scripture together. We spend time in prayer together. We share God's stories and Holy Spirit shout-outs. So whether a Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. or you join us at 7.30 a.m. on Thursday mornings, we want to extend the invitation to you to come and be a part of it. Come hang out and be part of the C3 stream. Thank you for continuing to be a church that embraces these virtual and digital ways in which we can be church. Well, I'll also lift up for you that we do have people available to pray with you right now and throughout Sunday morning. If it is not Sunday morning and you're tuning in at a different time, we invite you to pause, go into your browser, and find the place where you can click prayer requests. We continue to want and desire to be praying with you, praying for you, and praying over you. And so we entreat you to please take a moment and lean into prayer with other Christian brothers and sisters, whether that's calling in and hitting option seven, or whether that's filling out an online request so that we can be praying for you in that way as well. That said, Rachel will continue uh, with our closing hymn. Good morning, Christ Church. Our final hymn today is Go My Children With My Blessing. And after hearing Pastor Bob's message, I'm especially reflecting upon the second verse when we sing, Here you heard my dear son's story. Here you touched him, saw his glory. And I have to believe that Thomas, when he touched Jesus, and made that bold proclamation of my, my Lord, my God, that that was seeing Jesus in his full resurrected glory. So I invite you to please sing with me our closing hymn.
Dear brothers and sisters, receive now a closing blessing and benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his everlasting peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us as Christ Church. We continue to be a church that's about lifting lives, elevating Christ to church for those who aren't here yet. Thanks so much for tuning in and joining us. We hope to see you during the week and experience you online through all those digital and virtual mediums. And of course, we'll see you next week again on Sunday mornings. Thanks so much. God bless. And we'll see you next week.